having a teenager can be really challenging. And you are not alone. Today, we bring you an specialist. He has written more than 450 articles in adolescence. So you may want to hear from him. Stay with us. Welcome back to this Emotions in Harmony episode. If you are here watching in video in YouTube, we will put you the link for you also to have it in the podcast. It's going to be in the podcast Emotions in Harmony. This interview has been divided into two because it is so interesting what Dr. Carl has to tell us that we want you to take advantage of everything. Let me introduce you to Dr. Carl. Married with four children and three grandchildren, Carl Picard is a psychologist in private counseling and public lecturing practice in Austin, Texas. He is the author of 15 books in parenting, as well as illustrated psychology, young adult and children's fiction. He is also a graphic artist. He received an his bachelor degree and master degree from Harvard University. He has his PhD from the University of Texas in Austin. He is a member of the American and Texas Psychological Associations. He has been writing for the Austin Business Journal, for the Single Parent Magazine, for the Marriage and Family Living Magazine, the Austin360.com, and the Only Child Magazine. He also has been in TV for The Family Life in Channel 24 in Austin, for The Phil Donahoe Show, The Parents C101, The Family Digest, and The Armin Broad Show. He regularly writes articles for the print media about parenting. In 2010, for example, he was in ABC, NBC, CNN, and NPR as well as sourcing articles for the Time magazine. He has 450 articles in general written and published. He has written for Psychology Today, and his articles have been read more than 11 million times. As you can see, we have a wonderful guest today, very knowledgeable, but not only that, very compassionate, caring, and loving. So. It's a pleasure to listen to him. And today, we present to you the second part, which is ages from 15 to 23. And if you haven't listened to the first episode from ages 9 to 15, go back and listen, either in YouTube or in the Emotions in Harmony podcast. Enjoy this interview. <laughs> Let's go into the stage number three. Now the, the teenager is between 15 and 18 years old. So that's the age, I think, of stage of acting more grown up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these are the kinds of activities that parents get very nervous about because these are activity, older activities that can have powerful adverse you know, consequences if they miscarry, you know, all the way you know, from dating, partying, you know, driving. You know, substance use, the kinds of things parents, you know, wish they didn't have to deal with. But, you know, this is part of the courage of the parent is being willing to be able to talk about these things, you know, with the kid, not just wait, you know, wait for something to happen. But, you know, I mean, if your kid is going to start dating in high school, then start talking about, well, what are some, you know, what are some ways to do that to take care of yourself so that you don't put yourself at risk? Um, and maybe you want to try group dating before you do individual dating. You know, maybe you want to, you know, have, you know, have, a, you know, have friends that you can rely on to give you information about who you might be dating because they might have some data for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, about, you know, about that person. You want to go, it's hard because the 
acting more grown up. There's so much pressure for that. You know, because you have people talking about, you know, well, we tried this and we tried that. You haven't tried it yet. And all of a sudden, <laughs> they say, oh, no, I haven't tried it yet. Do I have to try that? You know, you're, you're trying to keep up with what's going on around you. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I think the, the kids that I see, the high school age kids that I see that get in, in difficulty when grown up activities miscarry, it's not that they don't know how to think. They do know how to think. That's not the problem. They just don't take the time to think. And that's what parents need to do with their kid when they enter high school, is encourage the kid to slow down some of these decisions and essentially take predictive responsibility. It doesn't take long. It just says, you know, just ask, you know, in less than a minute, just ask yourself, is there any risk in doing this? You know, are the risk worth the rewards? If I choose to take this risk and things miscarry, what is my backup plan? Mm -hmm. Just simple, just slowing down just long enough yeah. to have that override of awareness. That's functional worry. Uh, you know, the kid says to the parents, you worry too much. Well, worry is taking predictive responsibility. Uh, and it's useful. It says that, you know, let's think about what might happen. Not that it necessarily will happen. You know, so the kid says, you got a 15-year-old kid says, I want to hang out, you know, at the mall with my friends. And the parent says, well, you've never done that before. Oh, it's no big deal. I'll be okay. So, well, yeah, well, let's, before we talk about that decision, let's think about for a minute what might happen. Well, nothing's going to happen. Well, suppose, suppose you got separated with your friend from your friends. What's your plan? What would you do? And you just slow it down enough to get the kid to ask the predictive questions. And the predictive questions are not to scare the kid. It's just to put possibilities out there to be aware of. And that's, that's the side that parents are coming down on. You know, it's awareness education. And that's what parents have to do in the, in the third stage, in the high school years, is they have to say, you know, even though I would wish, you know, that you were not exposed to this, that you did not want to try this, or that you tried this, you know, since you might or since you have, we need to talk about, are there some ways to do this in a safe way so that you don't endanger yourself? And you do that out of concern. It's not a corrective response. It's a concerned response. And, you know, and you're saying as a parent, well, you know, just to let you know, I had my own adventures growing up. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I, per, I'm not gonna share a personal one my mom shared with me when I was, so I'm here, I'm in, I'm in bed at night, in the morning and my mother comes in and sits down at my bed and I think maybe I'm, maybe I'm 13 years old. And she said, Carl, there's something I need to tell you. And I thought, my goodness me. You know, my, she's probably really sick. Something's the matter. She said, last night I went into Boston and I went, and got, went to a party and I drank too much. And I was driving the car back from Boston and I was weaving all over the road. And a police officer stopped me. And... You know, my mom's about 100 pounds. And she says to this guy, why are, you, why are you stopping me? You can't stop me. And she starts arguing with the guy. And the net effect of that was she lost her license for six months. I mean, I have done my share of crazy adolescent things. But drinking and driving was not one of them. Mm. And that's, you know, I attribute that to my mom sharing of her experience with me and I understood that there are decisions that you make, you know, and there are decisions to avoid. And that's one to avoid, and that's one that I did. Yeah. Uh, so I guess that's another part of it is, I, you know, sometimes you, you get, a, suppose you get a 17 or 18 year old coming in for counseling. And you ask them, you ask them the question, you say, well, tell me a little bit about your parents. And the kid looks at you and say, well, there's not much I can 
tell you about my parents. Well, I mean, you lived with them for 18 years. It must be something. And then the response essentially is, all we ever talk about is me. And I said, well, I think, what, what a loss that is. Mm -hmm. Parents, what we give our kids is who and how we are. And to the degree that parents can self-share. Sometimes parents say, if I self-share, I will give permission. My mother, when she was sharing that, was not trying to give me permission to drink and drive. Uh -huh. She was saying, this, this is how she acted when she did this. And she just wanted me to know not only about her, but for me, you know, this is something to think about. A lot of times parents don't share enough. They're afraid if they share, they'll give permission. And I think that's not true. Yeah, or I can imagine if I share, I will be less of an authority. Yeah. yeah. I will be perceived as less of an authority. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes when I, especially when I have girls, uh, sometimes I work with them about body awareness, like, like oh, just, oh. just surrounding. Yeah. Just like don't get lost in your texting, in your phone. Right. Don't get lost. Um, in your conversation, don't get lost, especially if you are walking in the street, or especially if you are in a public space. Just don't don't get so lost that you don't you are not aware of your surroundings for oh, safety. That's yeah. a that's a great thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I put them examples of how we behave when do we go to a cashier to ITM, uh, when we go in the street, when we are. In, with friends, when we are walking to our car during the night, when we, how we need to be safe with our pores, with our phone, like all of these things that, God, hopefully one day save them one bad experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like, yeah, part of that awareness education is almost like as you go through this, particularly this stage of adolescence, you need not one, you need two heads on your shoulder. Yeah. You know, and one of the one of the first head is just experiential, what's happening now, but the second head is standing back and saying, you know, let's just look at, let's just think about this before I make decisions. Yeah. Uh, and, and that, and what you're describing, you know, the the awareness mm -hmm. is really really important. Yeah, and I I was like twelve probably when I told my dad I wanted to drink a beer. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. And that was in Mexico. Yeah. And he probably took him a couple of days to think about. And in the next party, <laughs> he was probably so concerned. Yeah? yeah. So in the next party, he say, come and sit with us. So yeah. he offered me his beer and he said, you are going to drink today with us. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. And it was like, oh, are you serious? <laughs> yeah. And he <laughs> said, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here with us. So I start drinking and he said, what do you think? And I say, no, I kind of like it. Yeah, it was a good beer. <laughs> and he say, okay, well, from now on, until you are much older, you are only going to drink with us here. When we are together as a family, you can drink and we can take care of you and never more than one, never, ever more than one. Wow. And... That was it. I think up to this point, I I never drink more than one. <laughs> <laughs> what a lovely example. Yeah, That's it really was fun. so lovely for my father that he was like, right. yeah, sit with us. Yeah. Was you see and, that? And that and that's the dance. See, that's the dancing with the dance with your teenager. That's it. And the dance was accommodation. And what yes. your dad did was. You know, he realized that this was an accommodation. He's going to have to adjust to the reality that alcohol is now in your life. Yeah. And he does the second step. He adjusts, but then he insists and he says, have a beer with us. See what it's like. You can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I mean, it's, you know, that's a, that's a beautiful example of a, of, of, of a wonderful accommodation by a parent. I was feeling so important because I was drinking with <laughs> my dad. <laughs> and, and it was, it really stick to me. It's like never alone and never more than one. Yeah. yeah? Never with your friends somewhere that you don't, cannot control. Yeah. Um, so 
it, it, it was a beautiful experience and my father gave me a lot of experiences like that. He so a like a very wise person. I, he was a very wise person and, and no education. He never finished elementary school. Right. Yeah. But he was listening. He was paying attention to what I needed. That's right. right. He was, yeah, he was, it was like he was keeping pace with you. Mm, yeah, <laughs> poor thing. Forward, he kept, you know, moving forward with his sense of where you were and responded appropriately. He did all his life, so he <laughs> he really had a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> so let's jump into the stage four, uh, stepping off on one's own. Yeah, that's about, yeah, about 18 to 23, all of a sudden mm -hmm. now. I mean, it's not just that adolescence begins with the loss of childhood. To some degree, it ends with the loss of family. And it is oh. being, you know, literally being installed within the family circle as you move forward, you're departing from the family circle. And that loss, that is a hard loss because all of a sudden you realize that this thing called responsibility, you know, that you took sometimes, but not all the time, you know, is now increasingly on your plate. That's a big burden. I mean, free, what you learn is freedom is not free. I had a kid a 19 year old you know he said it humorously but he, he meant it seriously he said you know i was freer in high school living with my parents taking care of things than i am at the age of 19 where i have to take care of it all by myself and that in fact you know that is the trade-off something happens here i think needs to happen with the parenting there needs to be a parental shift at this point. And the shift is that you move from vertical to horizontal parenting. Vertical parenting is where you are the authority in the kid's life and you're the manager. Mm -hmm. Now what happens is you become a, more of a horizontal relationship. You're essentially a peer with your kid at this point and you're another adult. And what you're doing is, you know, you're no longer an authority you know, you're a caring companion and you are on equal footing and you are simply, you know, sharing of yourself, you know, about yourself. And you are also essentially saying, and I am here to offer you, you know, any information or advice I can, should you ask. You open yourself up as a resource to the kid. And this is the age where all of a sudden, Kids who in high school didn't have much use for their parents. You know, after they leave home, all of a sudden have a lot of use for their parents because they realize their parent knows a lot of stuff that they need to know. And some of it's practical stuff, some of it's experiential stuff. And parents who can share that in a horizontal way, I'm not telling you as a parent how to live your life. What I am telling you is, you know, how I live my life, you know, and the, <laughs> what worked and what didn't work uh -huh. around this particular issue. So that it's a, you know, it's a letting go. I mean, it's a letting go for the parents because all of a sudden, you know, the family circle on a daily basis is diminished. And for the kid, you know, the kid is really burdened in ways they never anticipated. Uh, that's why sometimes when the kid leaves home, the parent thinks, the kid doesn't doesn't think of us anymore. They don't care about us anymore. No, the kid still still cares. The kid is overwhelmed. It is a they have a huge amount on their plate, and uh, one of the things that happens is that sometimes kids go out there, and you know a significant percentage sometimes lose their footing, and you know and, and they have to come back home again for a while to recover and you know, gather their resolve, figure out what they learned, and then try again. And that's no sin. I mean, that's just, it's hard to find your footing. Uh, but it's a, uh, it's an exciting time. I think it's, a, as I see it, working with parents and kids around this age, it's a way of redefining their relationship now in adult, adult terms, uh, and the companionship and the friendship, you know, the, you know, that it allows now, because at this point, both parties can look back and they say, well, we've had quite a journey together. 
you know, and we did a huge journey together. Uh, and uh, so it's a, you know, it's, 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 it's a neat, it's a neat period. It is the period, I think, of highest substance use, so you have to be very careful about that. If you see your kid making decisions of a self-defeating or self-destructive kind, you always need to fact you ask about, you know, you know, when you were making these decisions, you know, were you ever using at that mm -hmm. time? Mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes it's just that these kids are, you know, they're they're surrounded by a cohort of peers who are all slipping and sliding and breaking commitments and procrastinating and not knowing what to do with their lives, a lot of anxiety. So, you know, it's, it's, it can be quite chaotic in the, in the peer department. Um, yeah. You know, that's why having a home to come home to, having parents to talk to is a really stabilizing. What I noticed for the first year college students, they are also the victims of people offering credit cards and oh. selling them cars and stuff that they are sometimes unable to pay because they don't have the resources yet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's one of, the, one of the reasons I've seen kids move around homes is they get an they get indebtedness problems, you know, and then they have to come home and then they have to, you know, get a job and then they have to work it off and pay it off and then they go out again. But that's yeah. right. I mean, they never, kids never took a credit card seriously because it was their parents' credit card. Mm -hmm. They don't realize that when, when you move from your parents' credit card uh -huh. to your credit card, it's a whole different ball game. It's a whole different story. Yeah. yeah right, 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 <laughs> right, 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 right. You, you made, you made sound parenting so easy, Dr. Carl. Oh my goodness me, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think of it as hugely challenging. Uh, but it, yeah. It's, I mean, it's, I uh, see, I mean, think about, you know, giving birth and then, you know, preparing, <laughs> nurturing, you know, the next generation of human life. I mean, it's, it's pretty exciting. It's a, it's a daunting responsibility. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but I think, as far as I know, the best we can do is just to maintain our connection and try to keep our expectations so we can keep ahead of the growth curve. That's why I did the stages, so that I can help people anticipate things so when mm -hmm. these events happen, they're not, they're not blown away by it. Yeah. Uh, and, and I, I think you, you really did a good job in putting together these stages because it's more thinking about the parents and the families than the theory of psychology. It's uh, more, more really like near to real life. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I mean, I love, I mean, I love the coming of age passage. I mean, I just, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I write about it. And, I mean, I've got, mm -hmm. I've got some coming of age novels I'd like to sell at some point. I mean, I love writing about fiction and nonfiction. It's, it's really, it's very, very moving. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we can wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, is there anything else you want to say about these four stages before we close the episode? Well, I think just to say that it, uh, the thing to remember about parenting parenting is a privilege. Mm -hmm. It's a great, great, great privilege to be able to occupy that position in somebody's life, literally to give birth to the next generation of human life and to raise them to the point where they start, you know, you know, becoming, you know, fully individual and fully independent. Yeah. Uh, and it's, 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 it's a great, it's a great journey. And it's a great, you know, I think that's what you want to let your kids know is that it has been a great privilege to be a parenting part of your life. Yeah. Uh, and you always want to be grateful to your kid you know, for that privilege, and sometimes even hard times, you want to be able to be able to say that is that, you know, this has been, you know, it's not just that you've grown up. I've grown up because parenting is a maturing process. So I, as a function of being a parent, I am more mature now than I would have been if I had never had children. Yes, yes, yeah. that's true. And, oh, and even if I don't have children, Dr. Carl, I have 
uh, nieces and nephews and uh, right. clients and families. And, <laughs> right, right. Uh, at some point, I start. I had the steps on. Oh my God, it's a lot of growing. <laughs> it's a lot. Of growing. Yeah, it's it's a lot of growing. <laughs> <laughs> keep after it all the way through. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's a lot of growing for everybody involved in the life of a teenager. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> oh my God. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us today. Oh, I enjoyed it as always. It's always fun. It is always. And it's, I, I really hope it's going to help so many parents there to just be prepared. Yeah. Be prepared. Exactly. Yeah. Just, just be prepared and know that we are here with you. Right. 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 We are listening. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you're, I think as you described, yeah, man, I think you're a wonderful presence in the lives of the people that you help. It's such an honor, such an honor to be psychologist. It is. It is. It, a, is. it is a great. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I you know to think about think about it. Here, you and I are sitting in an office, uh -huh. and a stranger comes in and sits down uh -huh. and tells us about their life. And we mm -hmm. learned some things about life we have never known, we have never imagined. And we're, you know, trying to help the person navigate their world. But we're also thinking, my goodness, you know, life is so much richer and more complicated than I ever knew. Yeah, yes. Absolutely. It's an honor. It's an honor. It's really an honor in every stage of their life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so... Thank you, Dr. Carl. This is this is your home, Emotions in Harmony. And whenever you feel like sharing your wisdom, just tell us and we are here. <laughs> well, it was fun. Thank you. Uh -huh. Let me, well, um, if you are listening to this episode in the podcast, uh, we will put you the notes and I am going to put you the link to the article that Dr. Carl has in Psychology Today, uh, exactly the same article that we were talking. And I am going to put you the link to the YouTube video so you can watch it in YouTube if you want to. And vice versa, if you are in YouTube, uh, we will have for you the link. Go to Emotions in Harmony and find this and the previous episode from Dr. Carl. Yeah. And bye for now. <laughs> bye for now, Dr. Carl. Hey, thank you. It was fun being with you, Carmen. Take yeah. care. Thank you for being with us in this second part of Dr. Carl's interview. I hope you enjoyed. I hope it's useful to you. There is another interview that we did weeks ago about teenagers as well. And if you only listen to this second part of the interview, you can go to the first part where Dr. Carl talks about being teenager from 9 to 15 years old. I think it will be very useful. Thank you again. And please subscribe, like, comment, etc. And stay in our community. Join our newsletter. You can go to Emotions in Harmony slash challenge and find a free course on anxiety. Is there for you seven days of lessons where you can read about it, learn about it, and manage your anxiety. I am so happy that you are part of the community of Emotions in Harmony. See you in the next episode. Bye for now. <laughs>